Well, good evening. It's great to see everybody here tonight. Yeah, like George said, our, our last night in the Wilder Center. If you've been here starting four years ago, it is maybe a little anxiety provoking. Feels, uh, feels a little funny here. So um, anxiety. Yeah, if you look at this text, right, like just visually looking at it, you can kind of see that right in the middle, it's all talking about anxiety. And, you know, if you've been in the church long, if you were raised going to church, um, really any religion, right? Like the spiritually mature are not supposed to worry, right? That's kind of like a religious no-no. You're not supposed to worry. But yet we always have these anxieties and worries that we are faced with. Last week, I literally, I was vacuuming to help set up for the open house, helping Amy out and... um, as I was vacuuming, there was an electrician working on something. I realized he was on the phone, and so I stopped the vacuum, and I was like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize you were on the phone. And he literally said to me, oh, no worries, Akuna Matata, which I hadn't heard <laughs> in a while. But then as I was doing, preparing this teaching, I was like, okay, we're not supposed to worry, but like, is the answer Akuna Matata? Because that didn't work out so well for Simba, let me tell you, in case you haven't seen The Lion King. (laughs) But I was reflecting on, you know, just anxiety and worry and some of my greatest times of anxiety and worry. And I think those have been, and probably mutually for my children, is them learning to drive and then me literally like (laughs) trying to go limp and (laughs) you can pull them aside and hear uh, comical stories about that. But probably the worst one of them learning to drive was with my daughter, Anna. Uh, It was probably like three years ago. I also had this strong desire for all my kids to be able to drive a truck and trailer well. And so she was probably like 16 or 17 when we still had the hobby farm. And there was a boarder at our hobby farm whose mother had recently passed away, and she had gotten a job out at a dude ranch in Wyoming, just outside of Yellowstone. And so we wanted to serve her, and plus driving to Yellowstone, Wyoming is a lovely thing to help someone do. So we hauled her out there, dropped her off, spent the night. It was beautiful. And then since we had an empty trailer, we decided to drive a more scenic way through the mountains. And then it would be good for Anna to drive and uh, get some experience with that. And so it's her and Becca, Anna's driving, Becca's in the front seat, I'm in the back, and I'm like looking out the window, right? And there's this guardrail that you feel is like made of styrofoam or something. You're like, now what good would that do? And you can just see all the switchbacks because as we're climbing up the mountain and as we're getting up higher, it's like snowing. And Anna's driving the speed limit, But I'm feeling like that's supposed to be like during ideal conditions, not when it's snowing and you have a trailer. And I'm literally in the back seat, like (gasps) trying to control my anxiety that she's going to lose control and we are going to tumble to our deaths. And then Becca, in her wisdom, starts to sing to me, don't worry, be happy. (laughs) You know, the part about the landlord says the rent is late. It might be time to litigate. <laughs> you know, just like, I'm not sure how that's going to help me. But, you know, so what do we do with anxiety? We're going to face it. You know, it's like, it's a religious, spiritual no no. Is it a akuna matata? Is it just don't worry, be happy, even if you're going to get brought into court? Like, what do we do when we face anxiety? And so this text is instructing Christians to cast their anxiety on God, which is great, but it kind of also begs the question of like, yeah, but how do I do that? Like, what, what does that look like to cast your anxieties on God? And so the text starts with a command. It starts with a command to be humble, right? It says, therefore, humble yourselves, therefore. It's connecting humility to dealing with your anxiety, So what is humility? Um, Back to that, therefore, humble yourselves, therefore. The part right before that, that George taught on a couple weeks ago, said that God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore. So humility is the opposite of being proud or arrogant. It literally means to lower yourself in order to lift others up. 
And humility also foundationally includes a looking to God, right? It says, humble yourself under God's mighty hand. Peter, the author of this letter, who was an eyewitness of Christ, right, walked around with Christ, was an eyewitness uh, to Christ's humility. He's telling these first century exiled believers that they are to humble themselves by understanding God's power. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Understand that he is in control. He's got it handled. He is the one who is all-powerful. Nothing's outside of his control. Which can be a little scary, though, (laughs) as a human to humble oneself under the almighty hand of God. Unless you also know that he cares for you. Right? And that's why Peter also includes that, because he cares for you. And Peter has been unpacking this through the whole letter. At the very beginning, he talks about how Christians are born again into a living hope, not a dead hope, which George also talked about back at the beginning, that Christians are born into a living hope because of the resurrected Christ. And in the second chapter, Peter talks about how Um, Christians are chosen, that they're a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, that people who once had no identity and no belonging are now the people of God. Once without mercy, now Christians have mercy. Peter has been unpacking how much God cares for his people. So humility includes a looking to God, but it also includes a looking to others, right? By its very definition, if you're going under others to lift others up, by its very definition, humility includes a looking to others. But that's also why I think Peter is attaching at the end all these specific people, after he's told them to humble themselves, all these specific people that these exiled believers scattered in various pockets throughout rural Asia, Asia Minor, um, are connected to, right? Sylvanus, the secretary of the letter, who's telling them, who's writing to these suffering exiled believers, this is the true grace of God. He's reminding them of their connection to the author, of the secretary of the letter. He's reminding them they were probably exiled from Rome. He's reminding them of their connection to the believers who are still in Rome when he says she, the chosen she um, in Babylon. He brings up Mark, who if you've ever read the book of Acts, Mark was once disciplined and rebuked and rejected and not allowed to continue on with the apostle Paul and then later reinstate it back to that idea of a people of mercy. Like there's a connection with one another, specifically in humility. It's not an isolated thing, it's a community thing. And Peter right ends too with um, humility is a connection to one another in the fact that we're supposed to greet one another affectionately. So if we sort of have this 20,000-foot view in the air of this text, we see that Peter is telling these first-century suffering Christians, okay, I wondered what was going on. Now I see. So I won't like go like this to point to the text anymore, but there's some handouts, some there and there. Um, <laughs> okay, 20,000-foot view in the air. We have Peter encouraging these suffering first-century Christians to overcome anxiety by caring for each other and humbling themselves under God's power and care, right? And that's really a beautiful picture of life and human flourishing. Like if we were just serving one another and caring about lifting each other up and trusting God's power and love, we could like, you know, shut our Bibles and close our, all our philosophy books, shut down the internet, solve world wars, and have peace, right? <laughs> but the problem is we don't humble ourselves. We aren't living in a world where everybody's humbling themselves. And we experiencing suffering. 
Sometimes we experience suffering directly because of people's choices and not humbling themselves. Sometimes we experience suffering just because we live in this broken world and there's diseases and um, natural disasters and trauma, and we suffer. And when we suffer, we have more anxieties. Suffering leads to increased anxieties. When we go through suffering, we have anxieties over, are things going to be okay? Am I going to be okay? Are my loved ones going to be okay? We have more anxieties when our external environments are difficult. And the other thing with this text too, right, it isn't written like, if you should so happen to come along suffering, like it's, or anxiety, like it's an unusual thing, similar to suffering um, that he's been talking about. But it's like written from this standpoint, cast your anxieties on God with the assumption that you're going to be facing anxiety. Like we all go through this. It's not something unique or unusual. You're going to face anxiety. So the biblical definition of anxiety is the burdens, the cares, and the concerns we carry. Not all anxiety is bad. Paul actually uses this same Greek word to talk about his care or his burden or the anxiety he has for all the churches in 1 Corinthians in his letter there. But then there's the bad anxiety, right? There's the anxiety that makes like our muscles tighten up in our back and our neck and gives us headaches and causes sleeplessness and messes with our GI tract and makes the platelets in our blood coagulate together and cause plaques that lead to like catastrophic medical conditions like heart attack and strokes and other things. There's bad anxiety like that. There's also uh, bad anxiety in mental health, uh, general anxiety disorder. There's actually some good, solid, empirical evidence that shows when you have more suffering in your external environment, like trauma, like community violence, like poverty, the rates of mental health disorders like general anxiety disorder and others actually increase. Anxiety correlates to not only broken physical health, but also broken mental health. Anxiety can also connect to, right, having like too much of a worldly concern. It can be like in lighter things, like we just care too much what others are thinking of us or if they approve of us, will they like us? We can have maybe bigger worldly concerns like, um, you know, what is our government going to do that's going to impact me? Is my boss going to uh, discriminate against me or have unfair advantages against me? And those kind of lead to other worldly concerns that Jesus teaches not to be overly concerned on. Like, am I going to be able to have enough food? And am I going to have clothing and housing and shelter? And am I going to be able to provide that for my children, right? Like, we can have too much elevated concern with that. That's anxiety, Anxiety also connects to the spiritual domain, right? That's in this portion of scripture too. Anxiety can connect to spiritual attacks and harassment from even satanic powers. But in regards to humility, I think anxiety is what prompts us to ask, well, what if I humble myself? Wouldn't I be taken advantage of? Right? Like, that's a legitimate question. Like, if I go under others and serve them, how do I know I'm going to be taken care of? That's an anxiety, a worry that we have. And so the text is directing Christians to overcome the anxiety that they will inevitably face and even to overcome spiritual attacks through humility. Right, this text is really a picture of the upside down nature of the kingdom of God, which I feel like I talk about all the time, but it's so clearly here, right? Like the upside down nature of the kingdom of God is that you will overcome 
you will gain by letting go, not by grasping or grabbing or asserting yourself, but that you will gain and overcome by letting go, which is a picture of what Christ has done, right? We see this demonstrated in Christ's teachings. Christ taught the first will be last and the last will be first. You know, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? And Christ taught these things because he lived those things, right? Christ, being fully God, let go of paradise and heaven to take on human flesh, to enter into our brokenness, to enter into our suffering, to enter into our mess. Like, have you ever just had somebody sit with you in your mess? Not to condemn you, but to, to understand you and to love you and to help you get out of that mess? Because that's what Christ did. He sits with us in our mess to help us, to help us overcome. And then as he was in this broken world, found in human form, in human likeness, in human flesh, he let go of this life too as he went to the cross to really take on all our mess, all our sin, all our brokenness, and to overcome it by the ultimate letting go of his life and death. Peter says earlier in chapter 2, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. He who being the very nature of God, instead of grasping at power, he let go so that we can overcome. That is humility. That is overcoming by letting go. So Peter wrote this letter to help the church overcome anxiety, namely those anxieties we're going to experience in times of suffering, and to help the church overcome satanic attack by humbling themselves, by humbling themselves under God's power and God's love. There was... Um, a sermon I heard just on these first, the first two verses, six and seven, um, humble yourselves and casting your anxiety on God. And it was by a pastor. And uh, he talked about that um, during some summers in college, he did some construction work. And it was uh, brick lane masonry work. But all the other construction workers were skilled masonry workers. He was unskilled. So his job, the bricks, I don't, I'm imagining the skid steer brought them all and stacked them up on pallets or something, but his job was to toss them up to the skilled laborer who was higher up on the scaffolding working on, I don't know, the wall or whatever he was working on. And uh, so, you know, that was his job, just toss those bricks up to the more skilled worker. And to me, that's like the perfect <laughs> image of this text, right? Like, we are the unskilled worker. And we are to cast, the Greek word cast can mean the same as toss. We're to toss our bricks up to God, the skilled worker, the one who knows how to handle and work with the bricks because he is all powerful and he is all loving. And our job is just to keep tossing those anxieties <laughs> that come up to us. Um, God's the one in control, right? He's, he's all loving. He knows how to handle these bricks. We're not <laughs> all powerful. We're not in control. But even though we're not in control, right, we still have responsibilities. And our responsibility is just to keep tossing our bricks up to God. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes it's helpful 
as anxiety and burdens come at us, especially the type that just keep ruminating, like sometimes it's helpful to just like, to write them down. <laughs> like this is what is in God's control. That is not my responsibility. You know, here's maybe what is in my responsibility. I was thinking about um, 2001, 9-11 happened. I was eight and a half months pregnant with our fourth child. Stacy worked for the airlines, and um, eventually he lost his job, actually two years later, um, when, I, when we were pregnant with my fifth. You know, like those things are out of our control. Like what is our responsibility to keep looking for a job? 9-11, terrorist attacks, that's kind of out of our control, right? Like, you don't think, you know, maybe one day someone will use airplanes as a bomb and I'll lose my career for a significant time. There are things out of our control, but then there are things that are our responsibilities. And so it can be helpful to be like, this is out of my control. This is my responsibility. Keep praying and asking God, you know, for help. That's my responsibility to pray Solving, you know, all the economic problems is not in my control. Like, that is in God's control. And so, you know, we can write those things down. I even thought, like, maybe I might even do this in the future. Like, if you wrote it down, you could even just, like, maybe crumble it and, like, have a basket on a shelf and just, okay, that might be the school teacher or counselor technique in me, but I like those physical things that demonstrate what we are uh, spiritually doing, right? So spiritually, we're tossing it to God in prayer, and I think the really great thing that this text shows, too, is that we don't have to do this alone. In fact, we're not supposed to do this alone. We are supposed to be casting our anxieties together, right? It said in there, um, these uh, sufferings that you're going through that are common throughout the brotherhood, throughout the whole world. Like, we, we all are going through this. So um, if you find yourself in a time of suffering, like, share it with others. Ask other people to carry this with you, um, to pray for you, to be teachable to them, because they may have gone through it too. You know, just, just listen and learn from them. And then if maybe you've come through anxiety and suffering, and you're in that time of relief where it says, you know, God restores, which means to mend. And all of us have been there, right? We've gone through anxieties and sufferings, and then you get to the time of relief, and you realize, like, how much you've learned. There's a time of mending and restoration and confirmation and strengthening and establishing, like Peter says. And so when you find yourself in that part, right, like, that's the time to come along to others who are struggling with anxieties, in humility, with compassion and brotherly kindness like Peter has been talking about, and encourage them and help them to keep tossing those bricks <laughs> up to the skilled laborer. And the really great thing is, too, is that when we do this as a community, when we humble ourselves with one another, understanding God's power and his love, we grow in faith. And when we grow in faith, we're able to overcome those attacks from the enemy, which is another thing that Peter just writes like, it's going to come, <laughs> and resist him by standing firm in your faith, right? When we do this together, it helps us grow in faith, and that helps even overcome satanic attacks. It's always noteworthy to me, um, though increasingly less surprising, that when I talk to people at the Wellness Center, um, just doing basic pastoral counseling, how often mental health, like anxiety and depression, is coupled with spiritual harassment. Like it's interesting, and I think not by chance, that those two things are put together in this passage. But also when I was preparing this, and I was kind of chewing on it, um, you know, I was thinking, it hit me after a while. It, it, this may be, you know, obvious to first century Christians living in rural Asia, and maybe not so um, obvious to us as modern 
Westerners, but I was thinking about that line about your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion. And I realized, um, you know, a lion doesn't roar when it's going to attack a weak prey. Because if a lion roared when it's like coming up along a weak gazelle, the gazelle would just run away. All the lion has to do is be, you know, sneak up on it and then it can attack it. Lions roar <laughs> when they're, try when they're uh, fighting with other lions over their territory. Right? Lions roar. Sometimes you read reports like people were camping in the, I don't know, wherever, uh, Africa somewhere, because um, they're not in Asia so much anymore, but wherever they're camping, safari, and they hear a lion roar and how like intimidating and scary it is, right? A lion roars when it's going to attack to scare someone out of its territory. You know, if you think about that, that I'm assuming would have been obvious to Peter and the first century Christians, all that Satan can do, like, we're not a weaker prey through faith in Jesus Christ. Then I was really, like, kind of nerding out on my metaphors, like, well, I guess, in a sense, if we believe in Christ, we are in the line of Judah, so it could be, like, another attack the line. But we, right, in Christ, <laughs> we are stronger than the enemy, Satan. And all he can do is roar those empty threats. And I think we all know that, right? Like, we, we know those things are just empty threats and that all we have to do is overcome it by faith. But sometimes those threats sound really loud when we're alone, right? Like, that's a dangerous place to isolate yourself. It's important, again, back to that idea of community, to overcome, because there is no power when you have faith in Christ. They're just empty threats from the enemy. And I think Peter is also pointing to that attacks could be spiritual drowsiness, right? That's why he says, be sober-minded and watchful, be alert against even the spiritual drowsiness. I think C.S. Lewis makes the point in the screw tape letters, like if he can't get you explicitly, he'll kind of try to distract you with spiritual drowsiness. So, and finally, humility, it comes with promises, not only does humility help us overcome anxiety by God's power and love and overcome satanic attacks, but humility comes with promises, right? It says, humble yourself so that God can exalt you at the right time. There's a promise. He will exalt you. There's also the later promise that he will restore, again, meaning to mend. He will confirm and strengthen and establish you. And in the middle, I wish I had the text right in front of me and it's not behind me anymore, but in the middle too, it says about um, after the prowling lion part about how he has called us to be incorporated in God's glory. Like we all want to be glorified, right? Like we all kind of seek that glory. We, we want people to notice us. We want people to like us. We want people to lift us up. And that, that there's a part of that, that that's pure, I think. And God's saying, you will be glorified through faith in me as you're incorporated in my glory, which is exceedingly beyond what we should ever be able to have. But that's what God promises, right? That as we humble ourselves, even now, we're incorporated in his glory as we humble ourselves under his mighty hand and trust his care. So let me pray for us.